We're looking in John chapter 8, and we're going to read verses 31 through 36. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn in there with me this morning, and we'll read this together. It says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? And verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. So if the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. We're going to look at a message I've titled this morning, Free Indeed. And uh, let's uh, look to the Lord in prayer, and we will uh, check these verses out and unpack some things for us th today. Lord, we, we thank you for the ability to sing, to the ability to worship together this morning. We thank you for our freedoms that we do have. And we, Lord, we pray that um, as we now look to your word, that you might uh, continue to work in us, and make us free from those bonds that we might be under today, the burdens that bring us down, those things that we have may, um, may be weighing heavily on us, Lord. Help us to put those aside. Help us to be truly focused and wholly focused on your word and your truth today. And may you change us by it. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, of course, as we've said already, and as you know, this is Independence Day weekend, uh, just a day past the 4th of July. On July 4th, 1776, our group of founding fathers sat together and signed that declaration that uh, was to ultimately lead to the Revolutionary War and eventually break us free from the, uh, the bonds of Great Britain. And you know... Regardless of what you think about our freedoms and where we stand as a country today, the fact of the matter is um, we still have many, many freedoms that other countries don't have. We, uh, there's many places where we cannot, we cannot think about meeting out like this. And we don't tend to be aware or think about these types of people very often, but they are, they are many in number. In fact, if you counted up probably all of those in the world that had to meet in a clandestine way, or in a way that would be uh, in threat of persecution. They would far outnumber those that can meet in freedom on this Sunday. So we, we must value, we must recognize what we do have as freedoms. And I know that some of us are feeling today like some of our freedoms have been taken from us. There are groups that are protesting because they don't feel like they have... Many of us have felt... And expressed, I've heard from different ones of you, that we haven't been given the freedom that we deserve as Christians uh, in, in sense of why are we even meeting in the parking lot today? Because we've had a certain liberty taken away from us in that area. But the fact of the matter is, no matter what we may think we may have lost, we still enjoy the greatest freedoms of any country in the world. And we have to remember these things because... God truly has blessed our country. And the, the more we forget that, the more we realize there was maybe no God in this. The more we begin to, to think the wrong, the wrong types of thoughts, we, we can easily begin to neglect what we have been given. And uh, I will just say, as long as we are capable of meeting without breaking you know, the government's orders, and we're capable to do what God has called us to do as Christians. We're going to try to do our best to comply. But there may come a day and there may come a time when we are restricted to do the things that God has called us to do. And those are the times that we have to exercise our independence from the government. That day is not yet. We have freedoms that we have in this country that we can still exercise. And we can be thankful for the freedoms not that we have in this country, but this morning I want us to talk specifically about the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. 
This is what our passage really gets down to you today. Because the fact of the matter is, even though we have so many freedoms, every single person here today, online or in this parking lot, every single one, I'm going to make a bold statement, we are all in slavery. We are all enslaved to something in our life. We, we are in bondage in one way or another in some kind. We live in this free country. We don't think of ourselves as slaves in the traditional sense, and we aren't. But slavery takes away an individual's right to self-determination. The individual is no longer permitted to make decisions about themselves. They're bound to follow rules that are placed upon them or suffer consequences. And the one who is in bondage often has no ability to free themselves from their enslavement. For some today, you're enslaved to your job. You're enslaved to your work. You, you go do, you, you're, 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 a, you're a victim in that way. Your boss controls you. You have rules. You are maybe enslaved under your own devices because there's a lot of people today, workaholism, aren't they? They're enslaved in that way. For some, you know, it can be, uh, you, you might be in a marriage that you feel enslaved in. Some of you feel that your government has had its hand in bringing bondage to your life. Um, we, uh, we deal with many things that can enslave us. But the heart of all enslavement, no matter if it, where it's coming from, the heart of slavery, whether it's the traditional sense of slavery or whether it's the sense of the enslavement that we might feel in, in various ways, the heart of all slavery, as our founders knew, is always the same source. The source of slavery is always sin. The source of what will take away your freedom and take away your independence is always sin. To some manner and to some extent, whether you are in born-again Christian or not this morning, whether you are truly a believer in Christ or not, we are all in bondage in some respect to sin in our life today. And this is exactly what Jesus was trying to address with those that he is speaking to in this passage in John chapter 8. Let's unpack it. We'll look through these verses together and draw some applications. Jesus is speaking, and uh, in the middle of it, it says in verse 31, Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. Now, let's see the context. Jesus speaking to a group of Jews. And the Jews had, says, the Bible says, they believed on him. These were folks that had placed their trust in Christ. They had their faith in him. In the sense that we would use the word today, they were born again. They weren't no longer identified with their previous Jewish. They were to be identified with Christ. But do you notice what Jesus says about them? He says, you are believers in me, continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. So what qualified them to gain disciple, these believers? The answer is if they continued in his word. You know, a lot of people around us, well, I'm a Christian. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. But maybe we haven't let this words of Jesus sink in. He says, you might be born again. You might be a believer. You might be someone who has placed their faith in me. And you know in an eternal sense, you will spend an eternity with heaven. But the fact of the matter is, you are no disciple of mine. Because we have neglected his word. In order to be a disciple, we have to continuously be learning about him, reading his word, understanding his desires for our lives, trusting in his promises, thanking him for his blessings. In other words, being a disciple requires us to be consumed with learning about Jesus. I'll give you an illustration. Yesterday, I, uh, I took my family to Fort Roberto, and uh, they were having a... Uh, you know, demonstration with reenactors and people who were going to be dressed up in the heat of the moment yesterday <laughs> and, uh, and doing these, uh, the, you know, these demonstrations of what happened at the fort back then. There were interpreters there who would have uh, been able to explain to you 
the history of the fort and how people lived back in that day. And they, they were very knowledgeable people, people that really had spent years probably learning the, the ways of the people that lived in the 1700s. And the fact of the matter is, as typically works out for me, we got there too late. <laughs> as we were pulling in, there were no cars in the parking lot. And I, and I said, do you think they're closing up? Well, we got out of the van. The doors were open. We thought, okay. And as we approached the, the gates to the fort, there was a lady there closing the doors. <laughs> and we said, are we too late for all this? Oh, yeah, we closed at 4, and you didn't. we were just getting there at 4. Oh, okay, I said, I see. She said, but you're welcome to look around. And she did, she did let us see a few things, and uh, was very appreciative for that. So I figured, you know, here was our our chance to learn about the fort from all these people that had really learned about it. If you want to use it in the, the, this term, these were disciples of history. These guys that had spent their time, they had put on these, these uh, Revolutionary War era clothes, they had learned of the ways and the, 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 the history of the fort. They were disciples of history regarding that area and that region and the, this, this ways of life. But you know what? I didn't get the benefit of any of that. And so on the way out, I said, well, we walked around for a little bit. And we saw a few things. And on the way out, I said, well, I guess I'll have to give you my version so we can at least salvage something out of this. And so I basically, you know, tried to tell my kids, here's what I know about the fort. Here's what I know about the lead mine. Here's how I know how people lived back then. And, you know, within the trip from the fort back to the car, I had told them pretty much everything that I knew. <laughs> Why is that? because I wasn't a disciple of history. I really didn't have all of that knowledge. I really wasn't equipped to go and, and, and tell people about Fort Roberto. I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, like one of these reenactors. I wasn't on the same par with them. No one would say, hey, you, you need to dress up and be an interpreter here, because I only knew very bits and pieces, and I kind of put them together, and whether they were even all correct. I, you know the thing about being a dad, nobody can challenge you. Here's the story. Here's how it works. And uh, we get to tell the story, and, and, you know, that's how it stands. But the fact of the matter is I didn't know a lot of the details. The facts may have been all... Because I wasn't a true disciple of that history. I'm just a casual consumer of it. And I think the fact of the matter is there's a lot of Christians today that aren't true disciples, that aren't truly in God's Word. Well, if you ask them the basics, they can probably give you the, the lowdown. They can give you the rough sketch. They can give you the two-minute talk. But if you get into the details and you really want to know what's going on with Christianity and what God's all about and what the Bible has to say about this question and that question, yeah, we kind of start to get a blank face, don't we? We start to wonder, well, I don't know. Uh, well, uh, you know, we, we ought to ask somebody that. And don't get me wrong. We're all going to have questions we don't know. Don't come and ask me every question. I don't have all the answers either. But the fact of the matter is, as disciples, we should have a hunger and a thirst for God's Word. To be, to be learning, to be growing, to be diving deep into God's Word and understanding what it means to be a disciple instead of just being a casual consumer of Christianity. So he says, if you're going to be my disciple, then you must continue in my word. What does he say in verse 32? And when you do that, he says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see what he's saying? Continuing in God's word, continuing to learn about him allows us to be filled with God's truth, to know it. When we're born again, after we become a Christian, after we become a believer, we should be seeking truth about this God that we now have a relationship with because of Jesus Christ. That is what is to identify us as a disciple. Knowing that truth in our life, filling our lives with that truth of God will truly make us free. But the question is, what is he saying we are to be free of? free from. He says, the truth shall make you free. It sounds like a, a nice, noble statement for us to make, right? But what is it that Jesus is saying, filling our lives with God's truth, what are we free from? Free from condemnation? 
No. Because these are believers. The Bible says, if you've come to Christ by grace through faith, if you've accepted His redemption, if you've accepted the penalty that He paid on the cross for your sins, if you become born again, the Bible says, you, no, you shall have no condemnation upon you. But what does He say? You shall be free from something. We've been redeemed. We're already free. But what does it say in Romans 12, 2? Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. As you learn God's word and dwell on it and meditate upon it, your mind will be renewed and you will be free from the power of sin in your life. 